in the beginning. In the beginning, the incoming organizer must establish his identity or, putting it another way, get his license to operate. He must have a reason for being there, a reason acceptable to the people. Any stranger is suspect. Who's the cat? What's he asking all those questions for? Is he really the cops or the FBI? What's his bag? What's he really after? What's in it for him? Who's he working for? The answers to those questions must be acceptable in the terms of the experience of the community. If the organizer begins with the affirmation of his love for people, he promptly turns everyone off. If, on the other hand, he begins with a denunciation of exploiting employers, slumlords, police shakedowns, gouging merchants, he is inside their experience and they can accept it. People can make judgments only on the basis of their own experiences. And the question in their minds is, if we were in the organizer's position, would we do what they are doing, and if so, why? Until they have an answer that is at least somewhat acceptable, they find it difficult to understand and accept said organizer. His acceptance as an organizer depends on his success in convincing key people and many others, first, that he is on their side, and second, that he has ideas and knows how to fight ch to change things, that he's not one of those guys doing his thing, and that he's a winner. Otherwise, who needs him? All their presence means is that the census changes from 225,000 uh, 225, to 225,001. It's not enough to persuade them of your competence, talents, and courage. They must have faith in your ability and courage. They must believe in your capacity, not just to provide the opportunity for action, power, change, adventure, a piece of drama of life, but to give a very definite promise and almost an assurance of victory. They must also have faith in your courage to fight the oppressive establishment. Courage that they, too, will begin to get once they have the protective armor of a power organization, but don't have during the first lonely steps forward. Love and faith are not common companions. More commonly, power and fear consort with faith. The have-nots have a limited faith in the worth of their own judgments. They still look to the judgments of the haves. They respect the strength of the upper class, and they believe that the haves are more intelligent, more competent, and endowed with something special. Distance has a way of enhancing power so that respect becomes tinged with reverence. The haves are the authorities, and thus the beneficiaries of the various myths and legends that always develop around power. The have-nots will believe them where they would be hesitant and uncertain about their own judgments. Power is not to be crossed. One must respect and obey. Power means strength, whereas love is a human frailty the people mistrust. It's a sad fact of life that power and fear are the fountainheads of faith. The job of the organizer is to maneuver and bait the establishment so that it will, be public, so that it will publicly attack them as a dangerous enemy. The word enemy is sufficient to put the organizer on the side of the people, to identify them at, with the have-nots, but it's not enough to endow them with the special qualities that induce fear and thus give them the means to establish their own power against the establishment. Here again, we find that it is power and fear that are essential to the development of faith. This need is met by the, uh, by the establishment's use of the brand dangerous. For in that one word, the establishment reveals its fear of the organizer. It's fear that he represents a threat to the omnipotence. Now the organizer has their birth certificate and can begin their work. In 1939, when I first began to organize back of the old Chicago stockyards on the site of Upton Sinclair's jungle, I acted in such a way that within a few weeks, the meat, pa uh, meat packers publicly pronounced me as, quote, subversive menace. The Chicago Tribune's adoption of me as a public enemy of law and order, a radical's radical, gave me a perennial and constantly renewable baptismal certificate in the city of Chicago. A generation later, in a black community on Chicago's south side, next to my alma mater, the University of Chicago, it was the university's virulent personal attacks on me, augmented by attacks by the press that strengthened my credentials with the black community, somewhat suspicious of a white skin. 
Eastman Kodak and the Gannett newspaper chain did the same for me in Rochester, New York. In both black ghettos in Chicago and Rochester, the reaction was, quote, the way the fat cat white newspapers are ripping hell out of the out of Alinsky, he must be all right. I could very easily have gone into either Houston, Texas or Oakland, California. In the former, the Ku Klux Klan appeared at the uh, airport in full regalia with threats against my personal security. The Houston press printed charges against me by the mayor of Houston, and there was a mass picket line by the John Birch Society. In Oakland, the city council, fearing the possibility of my coming into Oakland, passed a widely publicized special resolution declaring me unwelcome in the city. In both cases, the black communities were treated to the spectacle of seeing the establishment react with unusually severe fear and hysteria. Establishing one's credentials of competency is only part of the organizer's first job. They need other credentials to begin, credentials that enable them to meet the questions, who asked you to come here, with the answer, you did. They must be invited by a significant sector of the local population, their churches, street organizations, social clubs, or other groups. Today, my notoriety and the hysterical instant reaction of the establishment not only validate my credentials of competency, but also ensure automatic popular invitations. An example was the invitation into the uh, black ghettos of Rochester. In 1964, Rochester exploded in a bloody race riot, resulting in the recalling of the National Guard. The fatal crash of a police helicopter and considerable loss of life and property. In its wake, the city was numb with shock. A city proud of its affluence, culture, and progressive churches was dazed and guilt-ridden at its rude discovery of the misery of life in that ghetto and of its failure to do anything about it. The City Council of Churches, representing the Protestant churches, approached me and asked me if I would be available to help organize the black community to get equality, jobs, housing, quality education, and particularly power to participate in the decision making in all public programs involving their people. They also demanded that the representatives of the black community be those chosen by the black community and not of those selected by the white establishment. I advised the church council of the cost and said that my organization was available. The council agreed to the cost and invited us to come and organize. I replied then that the churches had a right to invite us in to organize their people in their neighborhoods, but they had no right to speak for, let alone invite anyone into the black community. I emphasized that we were not a colonial power like the churches who sent their missionaries everywhere, whether they were invited or not. The black community had been silent, but at that point, panic gripped the white establishment. The Rochester Press, in front page stories and editorials, raised the cry that if I came to Rochester, it would mean the end of good fellowship, of brotherhood week, of Christian understanding between black and white. It meant that I would say to the blacks, the only way you can get your legitimate rights is to organize, get the power, and tell the white establishment, either come around or else. The black community read and heard and agreed. Between the press and the mass media, you would have assumed that my coming to Rochester was equivalent to the cities being invaded by the Russians or the Chinese and the, the, uh, and the bubonic plague simultaneously. Rochester's, uh, uh, Roch uh, Rochesterians will never forget it, and one had to be there to believe it. And so we were invited in by nearly every church and organization in the black community and by petitions signed by thousands of residents. Now we had a legitimate right to be there, even more of a right than any of the inviting organizations in the ghetto, for even they had not been invited in by the mass of their community. This advantage is the, div uh, is the dividend of reputation. But the important issue here is how the organizer without a reputation gets that, inv gets that invitation. The organizer's job is to disseminate an invitation for themselves, to agitate, introduce ideas, get people pregnant with hope and a desire for change, and to identify you as the person who most qualified for this purpose.
Here, the tool of the organizer in the agitation leading to the invitation, as well as the actual organization and education of local leadership, is the use of the question, the Socratic method. Organizer. It's a proposed conversation between an organizer and an answerer. Organizer. Do you live over in that slummy building? Answer. Yeah. What about it? What the hell do you live there for? What do you mean, what do I live there for? What else am I going to live? I'm on welfare. Oh, you mean you pay rent in that place? Come on, is this a put on? I mean, funny. You, you know, where can you live for free? Hmm. That place looks like it's crawling with rats and bugs. Sure is. Did you ever try to get that landlord to do anything about it? Try to get him to do anything about anything. If you don't like it, get out. That's all they have to say. There's plenty more waiting. What if you didn't pay your rent? They throw us out in 10 minutes. Hmm. What if nobody in that building paid their rent? Well, they'd start to throw... Hey, you know, they'd... They'd have trouble throwing everyone out, wouldn't they? Yeah, I guess they would. Hey, you know, maybe you got something. Say, I'd like you to meet one of my friends. How about a drink? That. That's how an organizer starts step one. Policy after power. One of the great problems in the beginning of an organization is often that the people do not know what they want. Discovery, uh, discovering this stirs up in the organizer that inner doubt shared by so many. Whether the masses of people are competent to make decisions for a democratic society. It is the schizophrenia of a free society that we outwardly espouse faith in the people, but inwardly have strong doubts whether the people can be trusted. These reservations can destroy the effectiveness of the most creative and talented organizers. Many times, contact with low-income groups does not fire one with enthusiasm for the political gospel of democracy. This disillusionment comes partly because we romanticize the poor in a way we romanticize other sectors of society, and partly because when you talk with any people, you find yourself confronted with cliches, a variety of superficial stereotyped responses, and a general lack of information. In a black ghetto, if you ask what's wrong, you're told, well, the schools are segregated. What do you think should be done to make better schools? Well, they should be desegregated. How? Well, you know. And if you say you don't know, then a lack of knowledge or an inability on the part of, uh, of the one you're talking to may show itself in a defensive, hostile reaction. Well, you whites were responsible for the segregation in the first place. We didn't do it, so it's your problem, not ours. You started it, you finish it. If you pursue the point by asking, well, what else is wrong with the schools right now? You get the answer, the buildings are old, the teachers are bad. We've got to have change. Well, what kind of change? Well, everybody knows things have to be changed. That's usually the end of the line. If you push it any further, you come again to a hostile, defensive reaction or to withdrawal as they suddenly remember they have to be somewhere else. The issue that is not clear to organizers, missionaries, educators, or any other outsider, really, is simply that if people feel they don't have power to change a bad situation, then they don't think about it. Why start figuring out how you're going to spend a million dollars if you don't have a million dollars or are ever going to have a million dollars unless you want to engage in fantasy? Once people are organized so that they have the power to make changes, then when confronted with questions of change, they begin to think and to ask questions about how to make those changes. If the teachers in school are bad, then what do we mean by a bad teacher? What is a good teacher? How do we get good teachers? When we say our children don't, uh, do not understand what the teachers are talking about, and our teachers do not understand what the children are talking about, 
Then we ask how communication can be established. Why cannot teachers communicate with the children? And the latter with the teachers. What are the hang-ups? Why don't the teachers understand what the values are in our neighborhoods? How can we make them understand? All these and many other perce uh, perceptive questions begin to arise. It's when people have a genuine opportunity to act and to change conditions that they begin to think their problems through. Then they show their competence. Then they raise the right questions. Then they seek special counsel and look for those answers. Then you begin to realize that believing in people is not just a romantic myth. But here you see that the first requirement for communication and edu education is for people to have a reason for knowing. It is the creation of the instrument or the circumstances of power that provides the reason and makes knowledge essential. Remember that a powerless people will not be purposefully curious about life and that they then cease being alive. Something else that comes with experience is the knowledge that the resolution of a particular problem will bring on another problem. The organizer may know this, but doesn't mention it. Because if they did, it would invite and encounter a feeling of futility on the part of the others. Why bother doing this if it means another problem? We fight and win, and what? What have we won? So let's forget it. They know, too, that what we fight for now as matters of life and death will soon be forgotten. And that change situations will des uh, change desires and issues. It's common for policy to be the product of power. You begin to build power for a particular program. And then the program changes when some power has been built. The reaction of the Woodlawn leaders was typical on this point. In the beginning of the organization of the Black Ghetto of Woodlawn, there were five major issues involving urban renewal all centering on stopping the close-by University of Chicago from bulldozing the ghetto. The Woodlawn organization quickly developed power and scored a series of victories. Eight months later, the city of Chicago issued a new policy statement on urban renewal. That day, the leaders of the Woodlawn organization stormed into my office, angrily denouncing the policy statement. The city can't get away with this. Who do they think they are? They will put barricades in our street. We will fight. Throughout the tirade, it never occurred to any of those angry leaders that the city's new policy granted all five demands for which the Woodlawn organization began. Then they were fighting for hamburger. Now they wanted filet mignon. So it goes. And why not? An organizer knows that life is a sea of shifting desires. Changing elements of relativity and uncertainty, and yet they must stay within the experience of the people they are working with and act in terms of specific resolutions and answers of definitiveness and certainty. To do otherwise would be to stifle organization and action for what the organizer accepts as uncertainty would be seen by them as terrifying chaos. In the early days, the organizer moves out front if any situation of risk where the power of the establishment can get someone's job, call in an overdue payment or any other form of retaliation, partly because these dangers would cause many local people to back off from the conflict. Here, the organizer serves as a protective shield. In if anything goes wrong, it's all their fault. They have the responsibility. If they're successful, all credit goes to the local people. The organizer acts as a septic tank in the early stages. They get all the shit. Later, as power increases, the risk diminishes, and gradually the people step out front to take the risks. This is part of the process of growing up, both for the local community leaders and for the organization itself. The organizer must know and be sensitive to the shadows that surround them during their first days in the community. 
One of the shadows is that is just about as impossible for people to fully understand, much less adhere to a totally new idea. The fear of change is, as discussed earlier, one of our deepest fears. And a new idea must be at the very least couched in the language of past ideas. Often it must be at first diluted with the vestiges of the past. Rationalizations. A large shadow over organizing efforts in the beginning is then rationalization. Everyone has a reason or a rationalization for what they do or don't do. No matter what, every action carries its rationalization. One of Chicago's political ward bosses, nationally notorious for his use of the, of the chain ballot and multiple voting, once unleashed a tirade, well seasoned with alcohol, on my being a disloyal American. He climaxed with, and you, Alinsky, when that great day of America, election day, comes around, that day of the right to vote for which our ancestors fought and died, when that great day comes around, you care so little for your country that you never even bother to vote more than once. Organizing. <clears throat> one must be aware of the tremendous importance of understanding the part played by rationalization on a mass basis. It is similar to the function on an individual basis. On a mass basis, it is the community's residents and leadership's justification for why they have been not been able to do anything until the organizer appeared. It is primarily a subconscious feeling that the organizer is looking down on them wondering why they did not have the intelligence, so to speak, and the insights to realize that through organization and the securing of power, they could have resolved many of the problems they've lived with for so many of these years. Why did they have to wait for them? With this going on in their minds, they throw up a whole series of arguments against various organizational procedures, but they're not real arguments. Simply attempts to justify the fact that they have not moved or organized in the past. Most people find this necessary, not only to justify themselves to the organizer, but also to themselves. It's an individual, uh, in an individual, a psychiatrist would call these rationalizations. As we call them here, defenses. The patient has a series of defenses, which in therapy have to be broken through to get to the problem which the patient then is compelled to confront. Chasing rationalizations is like attempting to find the rainbow. Rationalizations must be recognized as such so that the organizer does not get trapped in communication problems or in treating them as real situations. An extreme example, but one that very clearly spelled out the nature of rationalizations, came about three years ago when I met with various Canadian indigenous leaders in the north of a Canadian province. I was there at the invitation of these leaders who wanted to discuss their problems and solicit my advice. The problems of the Canadian indigenous are very similar to those of the American indigenous. They're on reservations, they're segregated, relatively speaking, and they suffer from all the general discriminatory practices indigenous people have been subjected to since the white man took over North America. In Canada, the census figures on the indigenous population ranges from 150,000 to 225,000 out of a total population estimated at between 22 and 24 million. The conversation began with my suggesting that the general approach should be that the indigenous people get together, crossing all tribal lines, and organize. Because of their relatively small numbers, I thought that they should then work with various sectors of the white liberal population, gain them as allies, and then begin to move nationally. <clears throat> Immediately, I ran into rationalizations. The dialogue went something like this. I should preface this by noting that it was quite obvious what was happening since I could see the way they were looking at each other as they were thinking, so we invite this white organizer from south of the border to come up here and he tells us to get organized and to do these things. What must be going through his mind is, what's wrong with, uh, what's, uh, <clears throat> what's wrong with you Indians that you have been sitting around here for a couple hundred years now that you haven't organized to do these things? And so, thus, it began. Indigenous leadership. 
Well, we can't organize. Alinsky. Why not? Because that's a white man's way of doing things. I decided to let that one pass, though it obviously was untrue since mankind from time immemorial has shown uh, has always organized regardless of what race or color they were whenever they wanted to bring about change. I don't understand. So I stated, I don't understand. Well, you see, if we organize, that means getting out and fighting the way you're telling us to do. And that would mean uh, that we would be corrupted by the white man's culture and lose our own values. What are these values that you would lose? Well, there's all kinds of values. Like what? Well, there's creative fishing. What do you mean creative fishing? Creative fishing. I heard you the first time. What is this creative fishing? Well, you see, when you whites go out and fish, you just go out and fish, don't you? Yeah, I guess so. Well, you see, when we go out and fish, we fish creatively. Yes. That's the third time you've come around with that. What is creative fishing? Well, to begin, when we go out fishing, we get away from everything. We get way out into the woods. Well, we whites don't exactly go fishing in Times Square, you know. Yes, but it's different with us. When we go out, we're out on the water and you can just hear the lap of the waves on the bottom of the canoe and the birds in the trees and the leaves rustling. And you know, you know what I mean? No. No, I don't know what you mean. Furthermore, I think that's just a pile of, pile of shit. Do you actually believe it yourself? This brought, uh, brought about a shocked silence. It should be noted that I was not being profane purely for the sake of being profane. I was doing this purposefully. If I had responded in a tactful way, saying, well, I don't quite understand what you mean, we would have been off for a ride around the rhetorical ranch for the next 30 days. Here, profanity became literally an up-against-the-wall bulldozer. From there, we went off to creative welfare. Creative welfare seemed to have to do with, since whites stole indigenous lands, all indigenous welfare payments are really installment payments due to them, and it's not really welfare or charity. Well, that took us another five or ten minutes, and we kept breaking through one creative rationalization after another until finally we got down to the issue of organization. An interesting aftermath is that some of this was filmed by the National Film Board of Canada, which was doing a series of documentaries on my work, and a film with part of this episode was shown at a meeting of Canadian development workers, with a number of these indigenous present. The white Canadian community development workers kept looking at the floor, very embarrassed during the unreeling of that scene, and giving sidelong looks at the indigenous leadership. After it was over, one of the indigenous leaders stood up and said, When Mr. Olinsky told us we were full of shit, that was the first time a white man had really talked to us as equals. You would never say that to us. You would always say, Well, I can see your point of view, but I'm a little confused, and stuff like that. In other words, you treated us as children. Learn to search out the rationalizations, treat them as rationalizations, and break through. Do not make the mistake of locking yourself up in conflict with them as though they were issues or problems with which you are trying to engage the local people. The process of power. <clears throat> From the moment the organizer enters a community, they live, they dream, they eat, breathe, sleep, only one thing. That is to build the mass power base of what they call the army. Until they have developed the mass power base, they confront no major issues. They have nothing with which to confront anything.
Until they have those means and power instruments, their tactics are very different from power tactics. Therefore, every move revolves around one central point. How many recruits will this bring into the organization? Whether by means of local organizations, churches, service groups, labor unions, corner gangs, or as individuals. The only issue is how will this increase the strength of the organization? If by losing in a certain action, they can get more members than by winning, then victory lies in losing and they will lose. Change comes from power and power comes from organization. In order to act, people must act together. Power is the reason for being of organizations. When people agree on certain religious ideas and want the power to propagate their faith, they organize, and that is called a church. When people agree on certain political ideas and want the power to put them into practice, they organize, and that is called a political party. The same reason holds across the board. Power and organizations are one and the same. The organizer knows, for example, that their biggest job is to give the people the feeling that they can do something, that while they may accept the idea that organization means power, they have to experience this idea in action. The organizer's job is to begin to build confidence and hope in the idea of organization, and thus in people themselves. To win limited victories, each of us will build confidence and, that, and the feeling that if we can do so much with what we have now, just think what we'll be able to do when we get big and strong. It is almost like taking a prize fighter up the road to the championship. You have to be very careful and selectively pick their opponents, knowing full well that certain defeats would be demoralizing and potentially end their career. Sometimes the organizer has to find such despair amongst the people that they have to put on a cinch fight. <clears throat> An example occurred in the early days of back of the yards. The first community that I attempted to organize. This neighborhood was utterly demoralized. The people had no confidence in themselves or in their neighbors or in their cause. So we staged a cinch fight. One of the major problems in the back of the yards in those days was an extraordinarily high rate of infant mortality. Some years earlier, the neighborhood had had the services of the Infant Welfare Society medical clinics. But about 10 or 15 years before I came to the neighborhood, the Infant Welfare Society had been expelled because tales were spread that its personnel was disseminating birth control information. The churches, therefore, drove out these agents of sin. But soon the people were desperately in need of infant medical services. They had forgotten that they themselves had expelled the Infant Welfare Society from the back of the yard's community. After checking it out, I found out that all we had to do to get the Infant Welfare Society medical services back into the neighborhood was ask for it. However, I kept this information to myself. We called an emergency meeting. Recommended we go into the committee, into the society's offices, and demand medical services. Our strategy was to prevent the officials from saying anything. To start banging on the desk and demanding that we get the services. Never permitting them to interrupt us or make any statement. The only time we would allow them to talk was after we got through. 
with this careful indoctrination, we stormed the infant welfare services downtown, identified ourselves, and began a tirade consisting of militant demands, refusing to permit them to say anything. All the time, this poor woman was desperately trying to say, why, of course you can have it. We'll start immediately. But she never had a chance to say anything. And finally, we ended up in a storm of, and we will not take no for an answer. At which point she said, well, I've been trying to tell you. And I cut in demanding, is it a yes or a no? She said, well, of course it's a yes. And I said, that's all we wanted to know. And we stormed out of the place. All the way back to the, uh, all the way back to back of the yards. You could hear the members of the committee saying, well, that's the way to get things done. You just tell them off and don't give them a chance to say anything. If we could get this with just a few people we have in this organization now, just imagine what we can get when we have a big organization. I suggest that before critics look upon this as trickery, they reflect on the discussion of means and ends. See the previous segment. The organizer simultaneously carries on many functions as they analyze, attack, and disrupt the prevailing power pattern. The ghetto or slum in which they are organizing is not a disorganized community. There's no such animal or as a disorganized community. It's a contradiction in terms to use the two words, disorganization and community, together. The word community itself means as organized communal life, people living in an organized fashion. The people in the community may have experienced successive frustrations to the point that their will to participate has seemed to atrophy. They may be living in anonymity and may be starved for personal recognition. They may be suffering from various forms of deprivation and discrimination. They may have accepted anonymity and resigned in apathy. They may despair that their children will inherit a somewhat better world. From your point of view, they may have a very negative form of existence. But the fact is that they are organized in that way of life. Call it organized apathy or organized non-participation, or, but that is their community pattern. They're living under a certain set of arrangements, standards, way of life. They may, in short, have surrendered, but life goes on in an organized form with a definitive power structure, even if it is, as Thoreau called, most lives lived in quiet desperation. Therefore, <clears throat> if your function is to attack apathy and get people to participate, it is necessary to attack the prevailing patterns of organized living in the community. The first step in community organization is community disorganization. The disruption of the present organization is the first step towards community organization. Present arrangements must be disorganized if they are to be displaced by new patterns that provide the opportunities and means for citizen participation. All change means, all change means disorganization of the old and organization of the new. This is why the organizer is immediately confronted with conflict. The organizer dedicated to changing the life of a particular community must first rub raw the resentments of the people of the community, fan the latent hostilities of many of the people to the point of overt expression. They must seek out controversy and issues rather than avoid them. For unless there is controversy... People are not concerned enough to act. The use of the adjective controversial to qualify the word issue is as, meaningless, is as meaninglessly redundant. 
there can be no such thing as a non-controversial issue. When there is an agreement that there is no issue, issues only arise when there is disagreement or controversy. An organizer must stir up dissatisfaction and discontent, provide a channel into which the people can angrily pour their frustrations. They must create a mechanism that can drain off the underlying guilt for having accepted the previous situation for so long. Out of this mechanism, a new community organization arises, but more on this point later. The job then is getting the people to move, to act, to participate, in short, to develop and harness the necessary power to effectively conflict with the prevailing patterns and change them. When those prominent in the status, uh, status quo turn and label you as an agitator, they are completely correct. For that is, in one word, your function, to agitate to the point of conflict. A sound analogy is to be found in the organization of trade unions. A competent union organizer approaches their objective. Let's say the organization of a particular industrial plant where the workers are underpaid, suffering from discriminatory practices, and without job security. The workers accept these conditions as inevitable, and they express their demoralization by saying, what's the use? What are you going to do? In private, they resent these circumstances. They complain. They talk about the futility of bucking the big shots and generally succumb to frustration, all because of the lack of opportunity for effective action. Enter the labor organizer or the agitator. They begin their troublemaking by stirring up these angers, these frustrations and resentments, and highlighting specific issues or grievances that heighten controversy. They dramatize, they dramatize and, uh, the injustices by describing conditions at other industrial plants engaged in the same kind of work where the workers are far better off economically and have better working conditions, job security, health benefits, and pensions, as well as other advantages that had not even been thought of by the workers that they are trying to organize. Just as important. They point out to the workers that in the other places, they had also been exploited in the past and had existed under circum uh, similar circumstances in the past until they used their intelligence and energies to organize into a power instrument known as a trade union with the result that they achieved all of those other benefits. Generally, this approach results in the formation of a new trade union. Let us examine what this labor organizer has done. They've taken a group of apathetic workers. They've fanned their resentments and hostilities by a number of means, including challenging con contrasts of better conditions of other workers in similar industries. Most importantly, they've demonstrated that something can be done and that there is a concrete way of doing it that has already proven its effectiveness and success, that by organizing together as a trade union, they will have the power and the instrument with which to make these changes. He now has the workers participating in a trade union and supporting its program. We must never forget that so long as there is no opportunity or method to make changes, it's senseless to get people agitated or angry, leaving them no course of action except to blow their tops. And so, the labor organizer simultaneously breeds conflict and builds a power structure. The war between the trade union and management is resolved either through a strike or a negotiation. <clears throat> either method involves the use of power. The economic power of the strike or the threat of it, which results in successful negotiations. No one can negotiate without the power to compel negotiation. Remember that. No one can negotiate without the power to compel negotiation. 
This is the function of a community organizer. Anything otherwise is wishful non-thinking. To attempt to operate on a goodwill rather than a power basis would be attempt it would be to attempt something that the world has not yet experienced. In the beginning, the organizer's first job is to create the issues or problems. It sounds mad to say that the community such as a low-income ghetto or even a middle-class community has no issues per se. The reader may feel that this statement borders on lunacy, particularly with the reference to low-income communities. The simple fact is that in any community, regardless of how poor, people may have serious problems, but they don't have issues. They have a bad scene. An issue is something you can do something about. But as long as you feel powerless and unable to do anything about it, all you have is a bad scene. The people resign themselves to a rationalization. It's that kind of world. It's a crumbly world. It's a doggy dog world. We didn't ask to come into it, but we're stuck with it. And all we can do is hope that something happens somewhere, somehow, sometime. This is what's usually taken as apathy. But what we discussed earlier, that policy follows power. Through action, persuasion, and communication, the organizer makes it clear that organization will give them the power, the ability, the strength, the force to be able to do something about those particular problems. It is then that a bad scene begins to break up into specific issues. Because now the people can do something about it. What the organizer does is convert the plight into a problem. The question is whether they do it this way or that way, or whether they do all of it or part of it. But now you have issues. The organization is born out of the issues, and the issues are born out of the organization. They go together. They're concomitants, essential to each other. Organizations are built on issues that are specific, immediate, and realizable. Organizations must be based on many issues. Organizations need action as an individual needs oxygen. The cessation of action brings death to the organization through factionalism and inaction through dialogues and conferences that are actually a form of rigor mortis rather than life. It's impossible to maintain constant action on a single issue. A single issue is a fatal straitjacket that will stifle the life of an organization. Furthermore, a single issue drastically limits your appeal, where multiple issues would draw in many potential members essential to the building of a broad mass-based organization. Each person has a hierarchy of desires or values. They may be sympathetic to your single issue, but not concerned enough about that particular one to work and fight for it. Many issues means many members. Communities are not specific organizations like labor unions with specific economic issues. They are as complex as life itself. To organize a community, you must understand that in a highly mobile, urbanized society, the word community means community of interests, not physical community. The exceptions are ethnic slums, where segregation has resulted in physical communities that coincide with their community of interests, or during political campaigns, political districts that are based on geographical demarcations. People hunger for drama and adventure, for a breath of life in a dreary, drab existence. One of a number of cartoons in my office shows two gum-chewing stenographers who have just left the movies. One is talking to the other and says, You know, Sadie, you know what the trouble with life is? There just ain't any background music. But it's more than that. It's a desperate search for personal identity, to let other people know that at least you're alive. Let's take a common case in the ghetto. A man is living in a slum tenement. He doesn't know anybody and nobody knows him. He doesn't care for anyone because no one cares for him. 
On the corner newsstand are newspapers with pictures of people like Mayor Daly and other people from a different world, a world that he doesn't know, a world that doesn't know that he is even alive. When the organizer approaches him, part of what be- he begins to be uh, what part of what begins to be communicated is that through the organization and its power, he will get his birth certificate for life, and that he will become known. And that the things will change from the drabness of a life where all that changes is the calendar. This same man, in a demonstration at City Hall, might find himself confronting the mayor and saying, Mr. Mayor, we have had it up to here and we're not going to take it anymore. Television cameramen put their microphones in front of him and ask, what is your name, sir? John Smith. Nobody ever asked him what his name was before. And then, what do you think about this, Mr. Smith? Nobody has ever asked him what he thought about anything before. Suddenly, he's alive. This is part of the adventure. Part of what is so important to people in getting involved in organizational activities and what the organizer has to communicate to them. Not that every member will be giving their name on television. That's a bonus. But for once, because they're working together with a group, what they work for will mean something. Let us look at what is called process. Process tells us how. Purpose tells us why. But in reality, it is academic to draw a line between them. They are part of a continuum. Process and purpose are so welded to each other that it is impossible to mark where one leaves off and the other begins, or which is even which. The very process of democratic participation is for the purpose of organization rather than to rid the alleys of dirt. Process is really purpose. Through All this, the constant guiding star of the organizer, is in those words, the dignity of the individual. Working with this compass, they soon discover many axioms of effective organization. If you respect the dignity of the individual you are working with, then their desires, not yours, their values, not yours, their way of working and fighting, not yours, their choice of leadership, not yours, their programs, not yours, are important and must be followed, except if their programs violate the high values of a free and open society. For example, take the question, what if the program of the local people offends the rights of other groups for reasons of color, religion, economic status, or politics, should this program be accepted just because it's their program? The answer is categorically no. Always remember that the guiding star is the dignity of the individual. This is the purpose of the program. Obviously, any program that opposes people because of race, religion, creed, economic status is the antithesis of the fundamental dignity of the individual. It's difficult for people to believe that you really respect their dignity. After all, they know very few people, including their own neighbors, who do. But it is equally difficult for you to to surrender that little image of God created in our own likeness, which lurks in all of us and tells us that we secretly believe that we know what's best for the people. A successful organizer has learned emotionally as well as intellectually to respect the dignity of the people with whom they are working. Thus, an effective organizer, uh, and and thus an effective organizational experience is as much an educational process for the organizer as it is for the people with whom they are working. They must both 
learn to respect the dignity of the individual. And they both must learn that in the last analysis, this is the basic purpose of organization for participation is the heartbeat of that way of life. We learn when we respect the dignity of the people. They cannot be denied the elementary right to participate fully in the solution of their own problems. Self-respect arises only out of people who play an active, ro uh, active role in solving their own crises, who are not helpless, who are not passive, puppet-like recipients of private or public services. To give people help while denying them a significant part in the action contributes nothing to the development of the individual. In the deepest sense, it is not giving but taking, taking their dignity. Denial of the opportunity for participation is the denial of human dignity and democracy. It will not work. In Reveille for, uh, Reveille for Radicals, I described an incident in which the government of Mexico once decided to pay tribute to Mexican mothers. A proclamation was issued that every mother whose sewing machine was being held by the Monte de Piedad, the national pawn shop of Mexico, should have her machine returned as a gift on Mother's Day. There was a tremendous joy over this occasion. Here was a gift being made outright without participation on the part of the recipients. Inside of three weeks, the exact same number of sewing machines were back in that pawn shop. Another example occurred in a statement made by the United Nations delegate from Liberia. Analyzing problems of Liberia, he noted that his nation had been deprived of, quote, the benefits of a previous history of colonialism. Press reaction was astonishment and ridicule, but the statement showed insight and wisdom. The people of Liberia had never been exploited by a colonial power, never been forced to band together at the risk of great personal sacrifice to revolt for their freedom. They had been, uh, they had been given freedom upon the establishment of their nation. Even freedom as a gift is deficient in dignity, hence the political sterility of Liberia. As Finley Peter Dunes, uh, Mr. Dooley put it, don't ask for rights, take them. And don't let anyone give them to you. A right, is that handed to you for, uh, a right that is handed to you for nothing has something the matter with it. The more things likely, it's only a wrong turned inside out. The organization has to be used in every possible sense as an educational mechanism. An edu but education is not propaganda. Real education is the means by which the membership will begin to make sense out of their relationship as individuals to the organization and to the world they live in so that they can make informed and intelligent judgments. The stream of activities and programs of the organization provides a never-ending series of specific issues and situations that create a rich field for the learning process. The concern and conflict about each specific issue leads to a specifically enlarged area of interest. Competent organizers should be sensitive to these opportunities. Without the learning process, the building of an organization becomes simply the substitution of one power group for another. <laughs>